Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by Letterman Row, our good friends at Byers Automotive. And uh, I, as usual, it's me, Jeremy Birmingham, there's Spencer Holbrook down there hanging out. Uh, we're talking about Ohio State football recruiting, and uh, we are now, what, May 20th, um, getting closer to some good news, it seems like, in the football front with Ohio State getting set to return to campus in the next couple weeks. Uh, at least on a limited basis, we expect that to happen. If you haven't checked out lettermanrow.com, you should do that. To read up on uh, what Austin Ward and Spencer are uh, hearing about that, but on this show we talk recruiting. There's not a whole lot going on right now that's good for Ohio State in recruiting, nothing that's really ultimately bad, bad. But uh, we'll start, I guess, with the latest departure of a talent from the Ohio State big board. That was Barrett Carter, the linebacker from Georgia, who ended up committing to Clemson on Tuesday night. Uh, as we sort of expected, and as I wrote about on Monday, this was a situation where Ohio State really did get hurt uh, by, by Barrett Carter and Jordan Hancock not being able to make their way back to Columbus in the spring. And if you look for like a tangible, uh, you know, place you can point to in the recruiting world where you're like, okay, did the, did the impact of coronavirus – did the loss of these recruiting trips really hurt Ohio State because you see all the commitments they've had? But in this instance, I, I think it's a guarantee that it hurt with Jordan Hancock and Barrett Carter. Jordan Hancock was going to commit to Ohio State. He had told every commit at, committed to the Buckeyes. He had told coaches. And then he never got a chance to get back to campus. He went to Clemson and, and everything changed. Um, once that happened, him and Barrett Carter, who were best friends and teammates at uh, – uh, North Gwinnett High School in Suwannee, Georgia. They they wanted to play together at the next level. I really think that had Jordan Hancock been able to get back to Ohio State and commit as he had planned to do, uh, it would have carried over with Barrett Carter and done the same thing. But that's neither here nor there, right, Spencer? I mean, sour grapes, you, you pick up, you move on. Ohio State and Clemson recruit a lot of the same guys. It just, it's just one of those things. They have similar similar cultures while not being similar – um, and that, this is what's going to happen sometimes on the recruiting trail. And things happen. Uh, a global pandemic doesn't happen every recruiting cycle. Right. Uh, actually, I think it happened the 1918 recruiting cycle and this. Um, so you never know what's going to happen on the recruiting trail. Sometimes a pandemic strikes and you have to uh, change plans. That's what Barrett Carter and uh, Jordan Hancock both did. And now they're in Clemson's class and not Ohio State's. And when you enter Clemson's class, we've already talked about it on this show, and, and there's, there are exceptions every six or seven years. But when you enter Clemson's class, you do not decommit. And so yeah. it's just one of those things where uh, you have to try and balance that, the fact that you still want to recruit these guys with the fact that they're going to probably remain committed to Clemson. And so you have to start to find other options on linebacker, and I think that's a good place for us to start. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about those other options a few times in the past. Uh, the other two that the Buckeyes have really gone after are Smail Mondin from Paulding, Georgia. He's likely going to end up at Georgia. He was planning to commit in December. He's now committing sometime in the near future. He's going to end up at Georgia. The other one that's on the list is Rajon Davis, the linebacker from California, who's committed to LSU. And that's the one that the Buckeyes, I guess, feel like they have the best chance at flipping. But I wouldn't call myself confident that it was going to happen. It's still difficult to A, recruit California kids, period. Uh, B, to recruit a California kid who's committed to LSU. It's a big time program and in the, in the country's best football conference. And uh, it, it's a relationship that again, is being hampered by the fact that we have no idea when he's gonna be able to get on campus again. Davis did visit Ohio State in March. Um, he, he was able to, be on a bus trip or a, a tour group that went around the country, but they were in Columbus for like three total hours. It was not an extensive tour or a really in-depth visit. So the hope is that they can get him back on campus. He has been telling people that he plans on taking official visits and that Ohio State will get one. But so did Elias Riggs and he never visited and ended up at LSU without incident. So um, there are some differences, of course. You, Rajon Davis's family has not moved from California to Florida to get ready for college. Um, you know, you, you wonder how the Buckeyes can sell it, saying, hey, you're the only other linebacker we're recruiting from this point because there won't be really an effort to, to flip Smail Mondin when he commits to Georgia. 
Um, Barrett Carter, they'll still talk to, but there's not a lot of confidence that they can get that done. So really it's Rajon Davis or bust at linebacker to compliment Reed Carrico. It's, and that's the, if that's the way it is and, and they don't end up flipping Rajon Davis, then I guess you just have to turn your attention to 2022 and, and take a, a rather large linebacker haul in 2022. And that's not an easy thing to do either because then yeah. we're talking about recruiting multiple guys at the same position in the same class that would all have to end up competing against each other for playing time at some point during their career. And so it's one of those things you have to balance. Do we do, does Ohio state go after another linebacker in this 2021 class just to make sure that this, the talent is still stockpiled or do you try and risk it and go after four or five guys in 2022, but then you run into the risk of, okay, how do we balance these guys with, you know, playing time and things like that and the message that we give them. So it's going to be interesting to see what the Buckeyes do moving forward when it comes to balancing all this and tackling this, uh, not problem yet. I wouldn't quite call it a problem, but I think it is something to keep an eye on. Yeah. And I know the thing is people always ask like, okay, if, if you don't get this guy, who do you get? How do you, how do you go down the list? But right now I, it sounds like a, an escapist answer, but there really isn't a way to determine who else you go after. You can't see these kids on campus. You can't see them uh, at camp or and evaluate what they're doing. So you really just don't know a lot. I think you're going to see, for those top targets, like, it, you know, and I wrote about it on, on Wednesday morning on Letterman Row, like J.C. Latham, Emeka Abuka, Hudson Wolf, uh, J.T. Tuamalo, these other guys that are like clear-cut guys that are top of the board for Ohio State in the 2021 class. If they don't get those guys, then it's going to be months from now until you start to really put together a replacement plan. And similar to what happened at running back in 2020, they had their two guys. They had their two guys, and they were only focused really on Bajan Robinson and Jalen Knighton. And once that happened, and once they lost both of those guys, all of a sudden you have to scramble and get back into eval mode and figure out who's going to fit the class from a personality standpoint. And they didn't get another running back committed for five months after that. So, um, you know, the Buckeyes obviously have a ton of momentum. They're the number one class in the country. Um, Clemson's going to keep pushing. Georgia's going to push. All those things are going to happen. But when you get into the season and, and people are back to playing football, and you know, hopefully that's able to happen, then you're going to get a better opportunity to see who the backup plans are. And I don't even really like to use the word backup plan, but I mean, I guess contingencies, plan B type prospects, whatever. Um, at those positions where you're recruiting one more guy, like the Buckeyes, to, to start going down the list and recruiting – the, the contingency plans to me is a loser mentality. I, I don't, I don't think for a program like Ohio state or Alabama or Clemson or Georgia, why on earth would you say, you know what, we, we should start recruiting the, the other guys to replace that guy because Ohio state thinks they can get anybody in the country and they should think that recruiting the contingency plans is a loser approach. That's what I think. Yeah, and this is the, the other thing that I think is really interesting when it comes to if you lose out on this guy, where do you turn? Because we talk about how this summer would have been huge for the 2022 prospects. Well, I'm sure you can probably tell us a number of guys who in past classes, the summer before their senior year, come to a camp at Ohio State and all of a sudden they're on the board. So yeah. like these, some of these 2021 guys that people think are like the backup plans would probably have worked their way into being the big plans of Ohio State had this summer gone a little differently. But now that there can't be any of these yeah. any of these camps or anything like that, you know, some of these guys who could have been bumped up to four star prospects and could have gotten on the radar at Ohio State with a good couple days at a camp in Columbus, they don't have that anymore. So it's not just affecting the twenty twenty twos, it's also affecting the twenty twenty ones. And I guess if you want to call them backup plans, it's really affecting the way Ohio State attacks this because you can't see some of those guys at your one and two day camps that you were able to in the past. Yeah, Mark Pantone mentioned that when we got a chance to talk to him a few weeks ago. I mean, he said that for the guys that have boxes that still need to be checked off, they're losing this opportunity, and that is very, very important for them. Uh, one guy I'll point to specifically in that respect would be Jack Pugh, the tight end at Hilliard uh, Davidson High School, Hilliard Bradley, I'm sorry. Um, you know, he's a kid that is a four star tight end, uh, one of the top 13 or 14 players in the country in his position. Ohio State is obviously all in right now on Hudson Wolf and hoping to bring in that um, 
commitment in the near future. But if they had an opportunity to see Jack Pugh in two weeks like they were expecting to two months ago, I think maybe that there would be less of a onus put on like, we got to get Hudson Wolf, got to get Hudson Wolf, because at least they know that there was an opportunity to, to really properly evaluate another player at the position. So it, it's just, it's such an unusual time and, and such an unexpected stoppage of all things that are normal in recruiting that I just don't know um, what a reasonable expectation is. But, you know, as, as I said, with Ohio state, like, they're going to go after the top players that they that they have on their board, and they're going to go at those guys until they don't have those guys anymore. And if in that case, they'll start to look elsewhere. And it's it's almost because there's no really other place to look. You're going after your top guys because they're also they're the top guys, but also because there aren't the way recruiting is right now. There aren't a lot of other options to look at. Well, shoot, shoot. I mean, you have 800 kids in this class who are already committed. Everything is different in this cycle right now than anything that we're, we're used to. So um, everybody is adjusting and that includes the coaching staffs and the, and the players and, and their parents. And how, how do you, you know, figure this out? I, I know I read a few weeks ago from Bud uh, Elliott at 247 sports about the expectation that there's going to be this huge run of decommitments uh, in the fall. And I totally agree. I think it's going to be a wild time for most programs in the country, I don't put Ohio state in that category because having an opportunity to play at Ohio state, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, LSU, et cetera, those kids are generally more locked in and, and making sure they don't end up out of those classes. Um, but are we, are we going to talk about Tennessee and Maryland again, Burm? No, not today. Um, <laughs> you know, I do, I do think it's interesting when you look at Twitter and the world of, of decommitments and, uh, Twitter teasing and who's committing and who's like w- everyone lost their minds t- 10 days ago because the recruits started posting steak emojis for some reason. Uh, nothing has happened that should make people be like, Oh wow. Steak emojis. That, that's what that means. I, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that like I have some inside information on that. Cause I don't like I've talked to a number of people about that emoji And it seems to me like they were pretty much just messing with people to get them to like freak out. And it it worked. Um, And then this week, Travion Henderson posted something about people not being or Buckeyes fans be ready. And when that happens, everyone freaks out again. Like there's no, there's nothing that is like directly related to those comments. And I think that's important people to, people understand that, like calm down. Ohio state recruiting is going to always, always be in the mix for really good players and good news for Ohio state is typically almost perpetually one or two weeks away from happening. Like that's the way it is. I mean, the, the Buckeyes recruiting is so good that you can make an evergreen statement like good news is coming soon for Ohio state. And it is going to be true 99% of the time. Right. So here's what I actually messaged you. We were having a conversation yesterday and I said, do you think Jack Sawyer and these guys are just getting bored? And then this group message they have, because everybody talks about, Oh, our class has this group message. Do you think they just sit in the group message? Like, Hey, Let's let's really uh, toy with Ohio State fans today. Let's get them fired up. We need to get this class, you know, we need to get them talking about this class again. Do you think they just do that? Because it feels like one person, all they have to say is like, hey, let's tweet. And then all of a sudden, Ohio State fans are like, our pets' heads are falling off, but in a good way. Yeah, I, mean, I don't I don't want to say that they're messing with people because I, I don't think no, that's No, maybe the that's the wrong, the wrong verbiage. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's the intention. I don't think the intention is to get people panicked or frenzied. Um, and not have some sort of substance behind it. I think the intention is these kids are very excited about the class that they have, and they're very excited about the class that is still to come and and people that are still going to be added in the class of 2021. There is a ton of reason for Ohio State fans to feel confidence about Emeka Abuka and JT Tuamalo and Jalen Davies and Hudson Wolf and, and even, you know, Jag- Jagger Burton and uh, JC Latham still, even if those ones are sort of going the wrong direction at the moment. 
there's still plenty of reason to be excited about what they have. And so I think they just see them start to get, um, you know, excitable about it and say, Hey, let's, let's pump this up because what we've seen in the last month on the internet, since Ohio state had their run of like those nine commitments in that seven week stretch, we've seen USC and Maryland and Tennessee and um, Clemson and Notre Dame, everyone else starting these little mini runs of their own, North Carolina, Even Michigan. Et cetera. Michigan doing the same. I mean, you know, it. they went to Massachusetts and came back with five players. Um, what happens is people like that perception is important. Okay. Look at North Carolina, for example, leading into the Evan Pryor uh, announcement when he committed to Ohio state, Evan Pryor, wasn't really ever considering going to North Carolina, but yet all the talk on, on social media, because North Carolina had a, a run of commitments was, Oh, North Carolina, he's going to North because the chatter, the chatter matters. And people start to be like, Oh, it's an echo chamber. And all of a sudden all the recruits start to feel confident and they start pushing and building relationships faster and trying to make things tighter. Um, and I think that it's important for Ohio state recruits to keep pushing the envelope and say, Hey, we're the number one class in the country, not you, not anyone else. We have 18, 17 commitments. Tennessee has 22 or however many they have, and they're still 50 points behind. Uh, Ohio State recruits, I think, and I, I'm not speaking this based on anything I've been told, but just kind of the way I read the tea leaves. I think that their intention is to just to let people know we have big things still coming in this class, and you need to be – you know, ready for it, whatever it happens. I don't, I don't think it means that there's anything immediate. I know there's been discussion about Hudson Wolf and him potentially committing soon. Um, people I talk to at Ohio State aren't quite as cut and dried about that happening. I mean, they, they feel like they're really involved in the conversation. Tennessee is making a big push there uh, because that's as they should. He, he's a Tennessee native, and you figure with the success they're having, that they'd be able to t turn that into some uh, momentum. But there is not an expectation that Emeka Abuka or Tuamalo or even Jalen Davies, who I think people expect to commit to Ohio State if he's able to, of doing that anytime soon. And so I, I just think that those, the Twitter teasing is, is really more about getting people to remain excited for something that, Buckeyes fans should be very excited about. You know, seems simple enough. Uh, you got time for a couple. Questions, I could be but... totally. I could be totally wrong. I mean, maybe there's multiple commitments coming, and uh, I'm just way out of the loop on this one. But um, I don't. I don't think that's the case. But I mean, I guess stranger things have happened. But yeah, but yeah, we have questions. What do we want to talk about? Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, just things I've been seeing on on the Twitterverse. Things I've been seeing online. Um, first of all. Uh, I know you don't have a crystal ball. What do you, what do you think about the uh, the new confidence meter on 24-7's crystal ball rating? Huh. I think it's actually a really good resource, um, but I think it also can be a tool where people can ruin some kids' decisions uh, when they want to decide. I love the crystal ball. I've always loved the crystal ball feature. I think it's awesome for fans. Uh, I don't think that the confidence meter does much good. Um, and I think it actually probably does more bad than good in, in a lot of ways, because what they did was take away the cloudy crystal ball, which I, I don't even know why you need to put in a cloudy crystal ball. If you don't, if you don't have information or if you don't have an inclination, then just don't put in a prediction at all. Um, but I'll use JT Tuamalo as an example of that. Tuamalo is incredibly private, does not talk to media, does not talk really to other recruits, does not, do any sort of of his own personal promotion he he talks to one reporter on the west coast from what i've been told and that's brandon huffman from 247 who does a remarkable job out there huffman's crystal ball for tuamalo before tuesday was cloudy so it's a i don't know like once you put in a choice and initially i think they had in a choice to whisk to washington and then took it off of that so then you have to go cloudy now they don't have cloudy, so you have to pick another school. And he picked Ohio State with a confidence of one. And to me, 
a confidence of one means I have to pick a school. I'm just going to pick a school. Uh, and so then you start to see all these other predictions come in based on, on the fact that the guy that he talks to or the guy that his family talks to put in a prediction, but it's a, it's a confidence of one. Like there's nothing to be gained by that. And so I, I talked to people pretty high up in the Buckeye recruiting uh, hierarchy on Tuesday. And no one is confident that JT Tuamalo is committing anytime before like December. But for a kid who's never visited Ohio State and doesn't really have a great relationship with any of the Ohio State commits, because, you know, they're friendly enough, they're amicable, but it's not like they're – he's not a kid who talks to these kids all the time. He's not like that guy. Uh, I don't think that it matters one bit or another if you put in a confidence of one on a kid who is committing six months from now. Like, I, I think that it's just a way to stir up conversation, which is great, and that's what you need, especially if you run a website that has – message boards and is populated by fans who are engaging in conversation all day long. But does that actually matter? Uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that it does. I, I love the crystal ball. I think that this sort of thing uh, is just a one, another way to keep people talking and, and to get people uh, engaged, which again, right now, what the hell else are we doing? It's smart to, to do that. It is pretty – before I get to the second question, I just want to oh, – it is pretty remarkable the, the job that they're doing over there, the evaluators, um, at, at putting together these top 247s and the guys, even at Rivals, that put out the top 250. They have not been able to watch any camps this summer, and for them to continue to up, update what they're seeing from these prospects, it's pretty remarkable. I think, you know, uh, there is a level think, of competition between us and, and 24-7 sports with the Bucknuts people, but, I mean, when credit is due, you have to give some credit to these these guys – the evaluators at 24 seven, I think they're doing a fantastic job of, of uh, continuing to update these rankings without being able to see these guys in person. Yeah. I think it's going to be funny to, to look back on this three or four years from now on NFL draft night. And everyone always does the whole, they, they had this person ranked here because without the camps, without the ability to evaluate in person right now, so much of this is being done on tape and that's what college coaches are having to do. But it's also what these talent evaluators from around the country do. And I'm glad I, I'm not, I don't consider myself a, a talent evaluator in any stretch, despite my love of recruiting and the idea that I generally can tell if someone's an Ohio State caliber player. But um, it's definitely going to be a lot harder to do that. So, you know, I, I have incredible respect for the guys at 247, the guys at Rival, the people who are – on the road every weekend watching these kids. I, I wish I could do it more. It's just not what I'm able to do with what we do at Letterman Row. Um, but it will be interesting to see how that translates three years from now from this class and the 2022 class. But definitely. I, I, I don't I love I, – again, I, let me reiterate. I love the crystal ball. I think it's an incredible tool. And I think it, it changed the way that people handle recruiting and analysis. But I also think that it's – at some point, a little overkill when you just change it willy-nilly and have a confidence of one. Okay. Next. Um, next question. Uh, I saw JJ McCarthy is transferring to IMG Academy um, with a little bit of uh, reports that, you know, he's uncertain about the future of high school football in the Midwest and, and IMG Academy is going to have a season, you know, because Florida is, is in the South and the South is pushing football even harder than even the big 10 is right now. Um, do you think that could be a trend in recruiting where some of these higher prospects find a high school that will allow them to play football this fall um, if things continue to trend in different directions? I mean, I think it's only smart to do so. I think you would see it. You should expect to see that more from kids who aren't committed to top 15 programs. But, um, you know, I, I also wouldn't be surprised if you look and see a number of kids try to take the um, – the JT Daniels approach out at USC and see, Hey, maybe can I enroll early? Can I, that's what can I, uh, Miller Moss could be doing that. I saw right. that can, as a report. Can I reclassify? So, you know, you look at those sort of options. Um, certainly the most fascinating thing about the pandemic and how it's impacting football and football recruiting is that unlike the NCAA where 
there will be a general guideline put into place at some point by the NCAA. Like I, I, I don't see any scenario where the NCAA allows the SEC to be the only teams practicing football. Okay. Like there's going to be a guideline put in place that will not happen with high school football. Like that is going to be to- totally based on the localities and the States. So uh, that is going to be interesting. I look at a kid like JJ McCarthy, he's in Illinois. You know, that Chicago is going to continue to, to stay probably behind the curve and, and the less dense areas of the country, uh, population dense areas of the country that they're probably going to be a little bit more uh, conservative when it comes to when they start football again and start that kind of stuff. Um, so I, definitely you think California where they've already had governors come out and say, Hey, there won't be any sports this fall. Like Ray John Davis's father on Twitter made a joke like last week, where are we moving to? What state are we moving to? Um, so I think it's a serious conversation that families and kids are going to have to have, but if you're committed to a place like Ohio State, Michigan, LSU, et cetera, I don't, I don't know that it does you any good to do that. For a kid like McCarthy, I think it actually helps him uh, potentially more on the field just because uh, playing where he plays, the competition level is going to be significantly better um, at IMG, and, and maybe that will help him be better prepared for Michigan in any, anyway. So, um, but – uh, on a national level, I don't think that's something you're going to see like wide scale movement because most places, all 50 states have begun some level of reopening up their economies and, and everything else and are looking at the fall for how to get things back to normal. But beyond that, we still have two months until fall camps would normally be starting. So uh, it's not like there has to be a hurried decision right now. Uh, last question. Uh, last question from me, and then if you have anything else you'd like to touch on, we can do so quickly. Um, so the recruiting period is still dead. Yep. Um, when the NCAA gets together, I think it's the 28th, correct? Yeah. Do you think visits will be allowed in July and into August, or do you think they'll still make July a, isn't at a dead month, or August a dead month? Do you think they'll lift that and make it a visit month now that they couldn't do anything in the summer? And how do you think that's going to go? I think they have to. I mean, again, it's all based on on data, and it's hard to say exactly what happens. But the national trends are positive, and so you start to see everyone relaxing restrictions a little bit. If you're going to allow football players and student athletes around the country to arrive back on campus and work out together and live in the same area. I don't see why you couldn't allow some sort of visit policy that allows for, you know, no more than five kids at a time or something like that. Um, Because once the season starts, if it starts on time, which, you know, we're still waiting to see, it becomes extremely difficult for kids around the country to travel. And, And so now you have this opportunity after missing all of March, April, May, and June, we're talking four months of visits and and evaluation. Uh, They have to do something to offset that loss for not only the schools, but for these kids and and the prospective student athletes. So uh, I would imagine that they will find some way to put like a three week contact slash evaluation period um, in there in the beginning of July that there used to be. I mean, Ohio state, the dead period used to run at the end of July through August. Now it start two years ago, it went to, end of June through the end of July. Um, I imagine that they will find a way to flip flop that around, but the NCAA is so arbitrary in everything it does that it's, uh, and there's no real accountability for like a person who makes the rules. It's so always just sort of this faceless committee. Um, I I don't know. I, I don't think that the NCAA can, feel positive or good about kids not being able to really look at schools because if you do that, then you now have to start thinking, okay, when do we change the signing periods to, do we push this back? Do we push this back? And everything just sort of becomes this trickle down effect that I don't think anybody wants. Um, I think that if you had set up a, a a visit and evaluation period from like July 1st through July 20th or something like that, you're going to make things a lot easier for people to, to make some informed decisions uh, prior to the start of, you know, fall camp and 
fall football. I think two things. I think two things that this does to the, the extended dead period does to college football. I think on the field results matter way more than ever in recruiting this year because you can, you know, right now they're being sold on a dream and not even be on a visit. Um, and once the season starts, if you're not winning, you're not going to get these prospects. Um, so I think on the field results matter even more this year for recruits than they have in the past, uh, which is saying something because obviously winning is the ultimate recruiting tool. Right. But I think that's going to be the most important thing. And I think the second thing, the summer of 2021 might be the most insane recruiting period we have seen in a long time. It's going to be fast paced. It's going to be, uh, I guess, rapid is the same word, but they're going to have to do rapid evaluations of these guys when they come to camps before their senior seasons. Um, they're going to have to host every weekend sh- that they're allowed to is going to have to have visitors because you can't have any right now. Yep. I just think, this is setting up for Ohio State to actually allow visitors in, the, in, the, in February when the SEC and, and Clemson usually have their visitors. I think it's going to force Ohio State to have to do that with this 2021 and 2022 class. And I think it's going to force uh, people to take visits every single weekend in 2021. I think it's just it's going to be fascinating how sped up the next year's process is going to be. Yeah, I, you know, if you look at it, we've talked about how many people are committed in 2021, right? Like 750, 800 kids already. What I'm really curious to see is if the 2022 class, if if that is a group of kids that slam on the brakes and say, hey, wait a second, we're not committing for a while. Or if you see a, a rush of them take their biggest offer and try to commit early just to like see what happens, knowing that it means nothing to commit this early. So I don't know. It's going to be interesting to continue to see the development, but right now for recruiting, what we're looking at important date wise, as you said, is the end of May, the 27th or 28th, whatever day that next uh, I think decision. It's the 28th. Be, I think it's the 28th. Whatever day that decision comes, uh, everyone at Ohio state and, and around the country is going to be sitting there with uh, bated breath because it's really going to determine so much for the remainder of the 21 class um, and then how, how you try to adjust it heading into a season that's going to be full of unknowns. So anything else, Spencer? Uh, no, I think we covered some good ground there, Burr. All right. Well, thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for watching. That's Spencer Holbrook. I'm Jeremy Birmingham. This has been Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast on LettermanRow.com. We'll catch you next time. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We got Letterman Live. We've got the practice report. We got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buckeye Key with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State athletics. We've got you covered here at Letterman Row.